Okay, so um, what you're supposed to do is log into your community edition and remember we made this folder called scalable minus data minus science. So we want to import here. And uh, what we want to import is this, um, this stuff, right? So you want to go here, right click this, copy link address. Um, and then um, we received some error in uh -huh. You have to download it locally and then take it from there. You cannot okay. do the URL. Yeah, so that's the safest way. If you download it to a file and import it as a file, that's good. Then you also have a local copy in case Russians or in Raid California, you know, we don't lose Oregon, we can still learn, you know. It's a good idea. So I, you know, yesterday's discussions were very interesting. So I thought I should maybe give a framework for how I am approaching these problems, right? So I, I studied um, at Cornell. I, I studied uh, probability theory and uh, mathematical statistics from uh, people in operations research and pure mathematics. So I have a different kind of perspective on probability theory and. Uh, so I'm much more interested in applied OR problems and things like this. So it's a different kind of, uh, it's, you know, we use the same textbook, you know, uh, but it's, it's a different uh, point of view. So for example, uh, you know, there is a very long program of study I've been embarked in for a while uh, and, and, you know, I can formalize this mathematically. Uh, I, for lack of a better word, I call this transtraditional mathematical statistical life experiments. All these words are sort of um, can be defined precisely, but uh, what I want to say is um, this is um, you know um, something released by uh, the, uh, called the Joe Report. How many of you know about the JOE 2010 report? Okay, so if you don't want the NSA to track it, don't go here. I'm sure they'll track this way anyway. This is all coming from GoDaddy. So this is my own copy of the Joe 2010. Right, this is a joint operating environment report. Uh, I'll just read the, the, the first couple pages, so this is the abstract. Uh, so this is uh, from the US um, Joint Forces Command, USJFCOM, ready for today, preparing for tomorrow. And uh, about the study, the joint operating environment is intended to inform joint concept development and experimentation through the Department of Defense. It provides a perspective on future trends, shocks, contexts, and implications for future joint force commanders and other leaders and professionals in the national security field. This document is speculative in nature and does not suppose, does not suppose to predict what will happen in the next 25 years. Rather, it is intended to serve as a starting point for discussions about the future security environment at the operational level of war. Inquiries about the joint operating environment should be directed to USJFCOM, Public Affairs 1562, you know, Mitchell Avenue, Suite 200, Norfolk, Virginia, 23551-2488, phone number, area code 757-836-6555. This distribution statement is approved for public release. So as a public, you're welcome to read this. And uh, so I strongly recommend reading this uh, if you, you know, if you really, well, if you want, I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, it, it goes into, you know, basics of, uh, you know, simulation games, war games, like there's responses from the Chinese equivalents of these guys. And there's a lot of really interesting information. The 421 problem that supposedly China faces with four grandparents, two parents, and one child. The Japanese grain problem, which they have not accounted for robotic controls that are entering Japanese industries and stuff. So there's a lot going on. It's out of date. But uh, it's kind of where I'm sort of getting one elementary part of my Sigma algebra, which just is a formalization of what information you have at your disposal when you're talking about things, right? So uh, I will tell you a couple more important algebras. It's, uh, so, um, okay, so this is, um, yeah, this is basic stuff. Um, yeah, and if you want, uh, we can confiscate these URLs. I'll, I'll post it uh, somewhere later. Okay, so the next one is um, this one. It's called the Manifesto of the Future of Seeds. 
So, I mean, I, I work for Dow AgroSciences, right? I mean, these are the guys that made Agent uh, Orange, or they say they were made to make Agent Orange, right? So, if you go to Ho Chi Minh City and look at the embryos of Vietnamese babies that were deformed from the spraying of Agent Orange in like chaotic orbits in the glass inside the museum, and say Americans did this to us, I mean, there is a history for this, you know? And I'm saying this not in t by saying, you know, I'm anti-American or pro-American or anti-Vietnamese. This is a formal way of reasoning about this. It's a, it's a tradition of Howard Zen. It's called a perspective from pluralistic histories, right? It's very important to kind of see things in perspective. So what has that got to do with the manifesto on the future of seeds? Because uh, if you really pay attention to what happened after World War II, there's something called the Bretton Woods Conference. How many of you know about the Bretton Woods Conference? Brilliant. So that's uh, that's when like <laughs> there's a new paradigm shift in, in economics, right? The, the paradigm shift is essentially that the US dollar basically replaces gold as the sort of reserve currency, right? That's a very different model uh, of, of operations. And, um, you know, and, and there are consequences for Bretton Woods Conference, you know, including the World Bank that was formed. And, and you know, of course, things have changed quite a lot from now. Uh, one of the things that was obviously done in the sort of uh, rebuilding of uh, West Germany program, and you know, sort of it trickles on to South Korea and so on, is to, um, you know, put all these big industries that were built during the war into action, right? Because people still need to feed their babies. I and mean, that's the bottom line, right? So, so they kind of recycled a lot of these chemicals. And, and if you want to get into the etymology of the, of the neurotoxins in pesticide lines and, and insecticide lines and fungicide lines, you can read some amazing work done by uh, Vandana Shiva and a whole bunch of chemists and, and Indian chemists who fight patents and Indian bio, bio, bio implementations who fight uh, patents. So there's a whole uh, thing on that, right? So, and then these guys, Manifesto on the Future of Seeds, are actually sort of people's movement that are interested in preserving seed, fight what's called biopiracy, where the notion, you know, the sort of originally English notion of property is starting to invade into germ blossoms. So if, uh, if you think I'm blabbering, then, you know, it's just our sigma algebras are completely out of sync, right? So that's kind of another very, very important fact because uh, uh, if you don't preserve germ plasms, it's not just preserving germ plasms, it's preserving the knowledge of the traditions that maintain the germ plasms. And when you enter into the forest of the Yavari Amazon, and just go bioprospect and don't care about the shamans that are dying, you will simply not be able to co-evolve with these taxonomies. I mean, the taxonomies are way more than Linnaean. Linnaean is just a visual, right? It's a visual fixed taxonomy. But this is like the olfactory, their visions. I mean, even the cacao that comes from the, the you know, the Inter-Andean Valley right now, the chocolate. I met the, 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 the breeders of cacao, right? They are breeding in a completely different way. They're not doing classical modern European empiricist uh, plant breeding that's actually going after germline property uh, uh, models, <coughs> right? They're, they're doing very different things. I'm still alive, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important thing to bear in mind because our models of sociological uh, uh, sciences like economics can actually directly interfere with our probabilities of existence into the future where our itself can be formally defined. Right? Is it just one subpopulation of humans, or is it some classes within different subpopulations of humans, or do we just drop it down and include other species that are close by? So you can formalize this because under the modern Darwinian synthesis, all life on Earth is one continuum, a continuous object in space-time, right? So you can formalize that, and there are studies, so I'm from New Zealand, and we have some of the best the mathematicians studying mathematical phylogenetics. So you can start talking about mathematical uh, notions of phylogenetic diversity and talk about preserving life beyond humans and stuff like this. Right? So that's kind of the, the perspective I'm coming from. And I think I thought, okay, well, there's reality, right? So this is just uh, a Google visualization on uh, arms trade, right? So you can put in United States, you can roll around. This is how much arms are moving in and out. Uh, Brazil is... Uh, importing, there's a Brazilian here, and exporting, right? There's uh, Canada and so on. Well, let's, let's, so we're in Sweden, right? So this is the second highest per capita uh, arms manufacturer after Israel, right? So if you look at this, uh, so Sweden is importing and exporting quite a lot more, right? So, I mean, you know, there's uh, NSCC, like it's, uh, it's an interesting, um, but it's good, you see, this is, and all of these things will be very different because post Snowden revelation, uh, so this is only 2010, right? Saab has been selling a lot of aircraft to South America. It's good for Saab. 
So anyway, I'm just saying there's all of this going on. So it's, and why is this relevant to social media? Well, this is absolutely relevant to social media. Our economies are just plugged into, well, one large chunk of our economies are plugged into this, right? Because uh, it's called the academic uh, military industrial complex for a good reason, right? So it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, just uh, that's where I'm operating from when I say things. Okay, so that took a bit of time. Well, nine minutes, right? I mean, so anyway. Um, so let's actually get into today's lectures. So I wanted to show you, uh, I can't show you the actual information about what I'm collecting and things like this, but uh, when you post in, in Twitter, it's, uh, it's called a public post. A tweet is a public post for, by definition, someone can observe it. So you, the, the whole argument that you can't observe what I'm posting makes no sense in Twitter, right? So, of course, there are rules uh, that Twitter developers have to abide by. That's a different story. And uh, so I can't show you what I'm actually collecting, but this is a live streaming job right now running uh, for, um, um, you know, it's just the second, second out degree iteration in our design, uh, where we basically start with the members of parliament and a few other uh, charismatic people of interest to some co-researchers I'm working with across uh, theology, sociology, and hopefully law soon. And uh, so we basically collect uh, any any status update that's related to any of these uh, individual uh, Twitter accounts in our population of interest. And then we, we get these live streams and you can see the activity level is quite high now. But what we did is in this streams is we already went one degree out. We looked at, so we, we took this, uh, uh, list of people of uh, interest, and then we looked into their historical timelines using the REST API, which you will get to use today. And then I can go uh, up to 3,200 tweets into the past for free, which usually goes for a couple of years for most people. And then I basically look at, uh, uh, you know, make a, make a graph and then look at who are the most influential nodes, other accounts in the historical timeline of my population of interest. So then I basically bring those most influential nodes into my streaming job. So this is called iterative, uh, retrospectively augmented streaming. It's a very clear experimental design. It's actually old stuff from statistical designs. It's a, it's, it's a sort of survey-based design, right? You go and ask someone, who did you have sex with? And then you go to them and ask, who did you have sex with? This for HIV treatment in India, or, you know, in a place like Africa or India. So these are network designs, exactly what I'm doing, right? So, of course, you know, we have about 8.4 million records. And in the first round, Trump is already part of our collector because Trump is actually very influential of uh, very uh, prominent politicians and people of uh, sort of political interest in Sweden. That was news to me. Um, so anyway, um, so this is a professional chart, so you won't be able to see what we're doing there, except some papers a few years down the road, maybe. Um, so this is currently what you should have, right? You should have your um, thing loaded up. And uh, it's kind of an ambitious plan today, right? So we'll see how far we go. And uh, I'm going to try to calibrate around when Simon shows up. Uh, I think he's supposed to show up. So, um, and we can change this as well. So my current plan was... I should maybe introduce what is machine learning and what's unsupervised learning and supervised learning because uh, we have some kind of variance on this information. Like, will this be a good idea? I mean, how many of you have taken a machine learning course? Okay, so, right. And the rest haven't. So, uh, all right. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's not a bad idea, okay? And even if you've taken a machine learning course, this way of doing it is a fully scalable pipeline framework, so which includes cross-validation and things like this, which you usually don't really get to play with in a, in a sort of typical ML course. Um, it's more also single machine focused, so it could still be useful for you guys. And why I wanted to do that is I kind of wanted you guys to broadly appreciate these these simplest examples of unsupervised and supervised learning. And then, um, you know, before we start getting into natural language processing, 
because NLP is not a simple thing, you know, it's, a, it's not easy to understand what humans mean in any language. So, uh, but it's a lot simpler to understand uh, how to recognize digits or, you know, or just uh, doing some clustering of, of, of songs by their loudness. So we'll sort of get these concepts down on much more concrete examples. And then uh, later on, we'll drop in the afternoon, if time permits, into latent directly analysis. Uh, which is what uh, Simon was doing. It's a, it's a way of doing topic modeling. And, um, and I sort of have this interesting one on Cornell movie dialogues, like how to cluster movie dialogues from completely different movies using LDA. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so maybe you can start a company where you only sell scenes of movies to people because they don't have time to watch a whole movie. I don't know. I'm definitely not going to pay my mortgage on that business model, right? So anyway, here is uh, other stuff. So I thought what I what I should maybe share is um, uh, at least put them there. Um, you know, this Twitter UK election study I showed you guys, one of these uh, retweet ideological forests from the UK thingy. Uh, so that's kind of done here by Joachim Johansson. So he did it as a course project last semester. So I might just leave that there if people want to sort of rip the syntax for stuff. And then, uh, and then Mariama, who's here, and uh, Lee, uh, who's not here, they, they followed up on Joachim's project and did another course project last semester, uh, where she sort of does a, a map partition RDD and uses a Scala library called Goose to go and do web scraping of the actual news articles that are in URL entities inside tweets. And then they do some topic modeling, LDA, right, on top of it. So these are like, you know, we won't have time to get into all this, but if, you know, you get what you put in. So if you want to get into it, you can kind of see what's happening here. And then the assignment is kind of like this. It's a little open-ended. So remember, this is a 2HP course. So it's, you know, I think it's roughly 50 hours of full-time work, according to Swedish law, my interpretation. So, uh, so there's a lot of time. I'm not saying you need to put 50 hours, but uh, you can show me, you know, what you have learned after whatever we get to cover today, right? So I would, uh, and I would like this to be focused on your own experiment in Twitter, right? You do something, you follow whatever. It doesn't have to be political. It can be rappers or whatever you like, music. I don't care, gossip, and then do something, you know. And it can be as simple as simply. Uh, copy pasting a few cells from one of the notebooks that runs and then just changing the user ID. It could be just as simple as that, right? But then I would like to examine this for those who want credit or certifications in one of the tutorials down the road. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the plan. <clears throat> okay, so machine learning, um, I think there is a lot of, you really shouldn't be taking this course to learn machine learning, right? I assume you already have taken a machine learning course. Um, there's actually uh, quite a few resources. Um, I think this one's quite good, Elements of Statistical Learning by uh, uh, Hasty and Tipsharani. Um, and then this one's actually like about 15 hours of expert videos by guys at Stanford on all sorts of main important machine learning methods. I mean, a lot of the inventors of the methods are presenting it directly, so you can go in. I mean, we'll get an overview here, but um, um, so there's the PDF, PDF of this book, um, um, Introduction to Statistical Learning with R. And then here are more theoretical ones. So this is the uh, elements of statistical learning. I, you know, you can you should be able to download these PDFs. Um, and uh, this one's, um, yeah, the solution manual. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of like providing you pointers into Amita Walker's course. Remember that course is already there for us in the, uh, what is that, in the education part of Databricks, right? So if you go to the community edition um, and you go to here, training and tutorials, and here is the course on scalable machine learning. So I'm actually like sort of plugging in there so you can continue further. And I highly recommend that because it's in Spark. You're using PySpark, but you know, I'm doing everything in Scala, but, but then the concepts should be, so all the labs are there, the full blown videos are there. Okay, you can chase these links. Um, 
Okay, so so and I do want to point out that uh, uh, you know doing machine learning in a mathematically rigorous way is um, is, is beautiful and it but it involves you know grad level courses in analysis and geometry, combinatorics and probability. And we will be doing a little bit of this, like one tiny vein of one particular L1 school for one tiny easiest problem of density estimation for the part five um, or part zero of this whole thing. Um, okay, so here is um, ML intro high level by Amit. So let's watch this. In this segment, we'll talk about what machine learning is at a high level, providing a definition, describing common examples of machine learning, introducing terminology we'll be using throughout the course, and defining the two learning settings that we'll be studying. So let's start with the definition of machine learning. It's a wide-ranging field and can be roughly defined as constructing and studying methods that learn from and make predictions on data. This broad area involves tools and ideas in various domains including computer science, probability and statistics, optimization, and meteorology. Common examples of machine learning include face recognition, link prediction, text or document classification, for instance, spam detection, which is a canonical example of machine learning, protein structure prediction, or in other words, trying to predict the protein's 3D structure given its amino acid sequence, and teaching computers to play games, such as backgammon or Jeopardy. Now let's introduce some common terminology, terminology we'll be using throughout this course. And to make this more concrete, we'll use the example of spam detection as, a, as another example. So recall that machine learning involves learning from data, and these data points we'll call observations. And observations are items or entities used for learning and evaluation. And in the context of spam detection, emails are our observations. Features are attributes used to represent an observation. Features are typically numeric, and in the context of spam detection, they can be, for instance, the length, the date, or the presence or absence of keywords in emails. Labels are values or categories assigned to observations. And again, in the context of spam detection, these can be an email being, spam, being defined as spam or not spam. Training and test data sets are the observations that we use to train and evaluate the learning model. Again, for instance, in the context of spam detection, this can be a set of emails along with the training data set is what we give to a learning algorithm in order to train it. And in contrast, a test data set is something that we withhold at training time and subsequently use to evaluate the algorithm that we, or the, the learning model that we devise. Now let's consider the two common learning settings that we'll be focused on during this course. The first setting, called supervised learning, involves learning from labeled observations. The idea here is that the labels teach the algorithm to learn a mapping from observations to labels. In contrast, in unsupervised learning, we're forced to learn solely from unlabeled observations. And here, a learning algorithm must find latent structure in the features alone. And there's two main reasons why we might want to perform unsupervised learning. One is that it can be a goal in and of itself to better understand our data, to discover hidden patterns and perform exploratory data analysis. Alternatively, it can be a means to an end. It can be, in some sense, a pre-processing step before we perform the supervised learning tests. So what are some common examples of both supervised and unsupervised learning? Well, in the supervised setting, classification is one common task, and the goal here is to assign a category to each item. For instance, span detection is a common uh, binary classification problem. Here, the categories of the labels that we're trying to predict are discrete, and there's generally no notion of closeness in the multi-class classification set. In contrast, regression is another supervised learning setting where we aim to predict a real value for each other, for instance, trying to predict stock prices. Here, our labels are continuous, and we can, in fact, define closeness when comparing predictions with labels. Now, considering unsupervised learning, clustering is one common uh, unsupervised learning task. The goal here is to partition observations into homogeneous regions, for instance, to try to identify communities within large groups in the social network. A second common unsupervised learning task is dimensionality reduction. Here, the goal is to transform an initial feature representation into a more concise one. For instance, trying to find a more concise representation of high dimensional digital images represented initially as pixels. Okay. 
All right, that's like much better than I can do in four and a half minutes. Okay, so um, yeah, so basically we need computer science probability and stats optimization and linear algebra minimally. And um, you know, you basically have two main kinds, right? You have uh, regression and classification. When what you're trying to predict is discrete, it's classification, and what you're trying to predict is a continuous thing, it's uh, it's a regression. And uh, you know, all these things like Go and all these things you're seeing, they're all various classes of uh, machine learning algorithms. So one's called reinforcement learning, another one is whatever uh, deep learning, and there's a lot of them. But um, Basic idea is uh, still uh, it's a probabilistic theory of uh, learning. Okay, so um, so here's a pop quiz. So um, not the ones that I've taken machine learning. Um, so what's the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning? Sorry. You know the answer before. We have labels. Yeah. So which one? Oh. Supervised. Yeah. Supervised. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So you, you have label data in the supervised learning because there's a supervisor or whatever that actually goes and marks the labels. And uh, then a new new data comes in without a label, and then you try and predict the label. Um, so that's Unsupervised learning, there are usually no labels, or very, very rarely there are labels. Well, actually, let's hold that case hostage for a sec. So there are no labels, and you're just trying to kind of understand something about the data, right? But there is this other interesting case uh, where the events of interest are very rare, maybe one in a million. This could be a very, very unique and clever kind of attack in a cyber system or some very uh, special kind of fraud in a financial transaction setting. So these things are uh, somewhat fall in between and there was actually a whole class of methods to deal with them. They're called semi-supervised methods and I don't know. Um, so this one I, 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 I watch later. This is very good. Uh, this is just a perspective from the Stanford gang um, at uh, Stats. So they also talk about it. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some famous statisticians. Um, so a typical supervised learning pipeline is uh, something we really want to um, um, quickly get into next. In this segment, we'll review the steps of a typical supervised machine learning pipeline. Recall that machine learning involves learning from data. So of course, the first step of this pipeline involves obtaining our raw data. And this data can come from a variety of sources, including web information, emails, genomic data or other scientific information, images, social data or other graph structures, as well as user ratings or other user feedback. Once we've obtained this raw data, we need to extract features from it. This raw data is typically in an arbitrary input format, and feature extraction crucially allows us to incorporate domain knowledge when representing each of these observations. Additionally, we typically want to represent each of our observations via numeric features. <coughs> and it's, it's important to note here that the success of a supervised learning pipeline crucially depends on the choice of features. Additionally, there's a connection between feature extraction and unsupervised learning. Super, unsupervised learning can be used as a pre-processing step for a downstream supervised task. And this typically involves in, this is typically involved in the process once we have a good representation for our observations, we're ready to perform supervised learning. And this typically involves training a classification or a regression model on a set of labeled training data. Once we have this model, we want to know how, how well it's performing. And how can we do this? Well, the natural thing to do is to see how well it performs on data that wasn't used to train. And so we can simulate this process by evaluating a test of that data. And this is labeled data that wasn't used for training. Once we perform this evaluation, we can decide whether we're happy with the current model we have. And if we're not, we can iterate. And this typically involves extracting new features and or trying different supervised learning Okay, so there are some math people here. So I'm gonna ask a slightly uh, difficult question now. So um, so this this way of justifying uh, you know, 
uh, supervised learning and model uh, uh, tuning using this evaluation of unseen data is called uh, empirical risk minimization. There is a whole uh, justification for this kind of theory, right? But um, so can you guys guess what can go wrong in this, or in this model? So yeah. if you use always the same uh, external data set as evaluation and you do the hyperparameter tuning on your model, <coughs> basically you are using uh, your, uh, I mean, your unseen data is not unseen anymore if you use it more than once. Okay, let's make this very concrete. This is actually super important, right? And it's, um, it really goes back to the actual assumptions. So um, let's just, let me just write here. So, so suppose this data after the feature extraction part, uh, let's call this some, some X capital X1, capital X2, and so on, right? And capital Xn. So there are n points, n could be very large. So, and then um, there is this phase where you're doing, um, uh, you know, um, you know, where you're sort of training the model, right? So you take some subset of this data, right? So one, one algorithm will be take the first uh, M of them, right? Up to say XM. And then this is XM plus one up to XM. So say take the first M of them and use this to train, right? This is one approach. And then you can say, oh, the remaining part is, uh, you know, test or validate whatever. <coughs> Um, so, I don't know, is this okay? I mean, there are rules about how this, this fraction cannot be bigger than one third, and it you know, depends on them. But you know, so usually people use say 20% or 30%, 70, 60, 40, whatever you want. So I'm not worried about that. So M is roughly, uh, you know, 60% of N, say ceiling or floor. So is this okay to just take the first 60% of the data to do training? Okay, so that's, uh, that's one, one, one good idea. So one could you know, take a pseudo random number generator, fix a seed or whatever, and then, and, uh, you know, so this will be 0 0.1, 2, 3, some numbers between 0 and 1, 0 0.72 something and so on. And then you, 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 you do a sort on this pseudo random stream, so you sort the data, that's called a permutation. And then you can do, use the first 60% of the permuted data. That's one approach. Uh, cross validation? Okay, so for me, okay, so cross validation, uh, okay, so for me right now, test, test includes cross validation. Well, okay. So if you really want to be more computer science style, then there's validation data and then there's test data, you know? So I'm kind of breaking the validation and test into this n plus one to n bucket for now. It's, that's a different issue. Okay, so you can use it as it is, you can randomize and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, but there is something going on, right? There is a fundamental assumption under the hood actually, which is, um, so usually, in a lot of these models, um, you will have something like this, x1 to xn is independent and identically distributed according to some uh, you know, unknown uh, distribution that comes from some class or something, some type, right? This kind of is really behind uh, under the hood, right? It's like it's the same experiment as doing independent and identically uh, distributed Bernoulli coin flips, okay? So, um, so all of this is only really valid up to this assumption. You know, of course you can say, well, this process is varying through time, so suppose I have a continuous stream, not just n, and then this f itself is time dependent, and blah, blah, blah. I think those are just perturbations on the idea, right? Make it more clock dependent. So just be aware that um, sampling, uh, you know, matters, because what your assumption is matters. Finally, when we're happy with, with the, the model that we uh, generated, we can use it to make predictions on future observations, or in other words, observations that really don't have limits. Okay. Do you guys know this guy, Noam Chomsky? Yes. Yeah. He's a pretty amazing human being. Um, 
Okay, so then um, this is uh, an example of a classification pipeline. I think you should, you know, if you want, watch this later. It's a really good primer for natural language processing, right? How do you, what do you do with bag of words models? Uh, it's uh, very close to a lot of the things, um, you know, Simon talked about yesterday can be cast as a, as a, as a simple bag of words problem if you have training data. Um, so that's kind of uh, my sort of crash intro to ML. We're doing really well on time. This is good. So are you, are you guys comfortable with all these swear words, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, classification, regression, validation, test, training, prediction? Okay. So now uh, let's, let's continue. Um, I'm going to do something um, a bit more uh, explicit. So I think uh, some of the guys like Mariama, maybe this is a repeat, so you can play along. Hey, do you want to just uh, do a on-the-spot presentation of your thing? You could prepare for it. No, why not? Could be good. But anyway, I don't know if you'll have time, so you know, you can think about maybe doing that. I mean, you know, it's like rap, right? It's like, what do you call it? What is that kind of poetry slam poem? <laughs> you can do like slam data science. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, so this is a Kaggle uh, challenge data set. Uh, so it's, uh, a lot of people have used this, uh, one million songs data set. And the idea is to predict which songs a user will listen to, right? So, uh, and what I've done is basically uh, done a Scala version of this uh, Python notebook I found in the community edition of Databricks in 2016. So um, here is where the, you can learn much more about the data. Okay, so um, let's take a look quickly. So how many of you guys know about Kaggle? Okay, so yeah, so this is uh, a great business model. How do you get very clever people in the world to solve problems for free for you? <laughs> so I mean, it's, uh, it's really good. Um, so yeah, this is the data set. Um, we can, you know, we'll, we'll look into it by just doing SQL directly. So here's our main step. So we're gonna first do ETL, extract, transform, load. Um, and uh, this parses the raw text and creates a cache table. Then what we're going to do is uh, some uh, simple exploration, like with SQL and, and visually using Databricks' display function. Um, so we'll sort of explore different aspects of the songs table. And then uh, the last step was modeling. So we'll use Spark's machine learning library to cluster songs based on some of their attributes. So this will be our first sort of, uh, you know, slight dive into uh, one of the three main libraries for us, uh, Apache Spark, right? The machine learning library. Okay, so, um, so here are the steps in ETL. We will first um, uh, uh, create an RDD, and then we'll do reading and transforming of RDDs. Um, we'll get into schema and make a Spark data frame, and then uh, create temporary tables, and then cache those tables and, and play with them. So um, again, the sort of Spark world is like a tale of three uh, uh, RDDs, whatever you want to call it. So I try to uh, go between RDDs and data frames a lot when I use the machine learning library because I haven't descended into Spark 2.3 properly or 2. Point, yeah, 2.3 yet. Uh, but I think a lot of the machine learning pipelines are still using, were still using data frames a few months ago. So. Um, Okay, so, and then some of the machine learning library uses only RDD, so you need to kind of babble between the three formats, depending on. Okay, um, and then, yeah, we'll just, uh, we'll also show you how to use ggplot, and which is like matplotlib for Python people, because once you've registered it as a temporary table, you can just dive into R or Python, and, you know, some libraries won't work, and, you know, you need to do Google search and work hard, you know, I can't figure out, I just will have to do a Google search as well. But I'll show you some basic ggplot stuff will work without any change or any imports of special libraries. Okay, so and then we'll also do a bit of model tuning um, after um, doing feature extractions and fitting our um, model. So here's step one, parsing the songs data. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to just use this. I hope this is there in the community edition. It should be there. Is it there? 
Otherwise, we'll figure out something. So everyone gets something. Okay, great. Um, so you see, you you have um, the songs uh, directory containing data 001 with various parts, and so these parts have to do with the distributed file thing, and it's split up into different parts and so on. Uh, so let's now um, actually look at the header file. Remember the first file was this header.txt, so let's see what's there. So all I'm doing is uh, spark context.txt file. Just read that text file, collect it, bring it to the driver as an array of strings, right? Because the text file method will read the, the, the file according to end of line splits. So, so I just have this. All it says is uh, I have artist ID, which is a string, artist latitude, which is a double longitude, so artist location name, and the loudness of the song, song hotness, I don't know, song ID, tempo, so on, so forth. Right? Okay, so that looks like the column headers for the, for the data. So then uh, I'm just taking, if I just do dot take two, I just see two of the elements in the array now. Um, and then I want to uh, find out how many uh, elements are in this. So it's 20. Um, so there's 20 rows here. Um, so each line in the header consists of a name and a type separated by colon. So we need to parse the header file as follows. So what are we doing? We, we take the uh, RDD, which is the text file line by line, and then we map each line to this closure, right? And what's in here? We declare an immutable called header element, val. And this header element is taking the line that's coming in and splitting it by colon, right? And then I, I split it by colon, so now I'm going to have the header element part zero and part two. So and if I collect it, I'm going to see an array of, of two tuples, right? So I know this is artist ID string, artist latitude double, and so on. So now we're going to define a case class, right? This is like the lightweight Scala class, which essentially helps us specify the types of the things that are in the columns, um, called song. And then this will be used to represent each row of the data in the files. Uh, so if um, so, here I'm going to look at uh, just part zero zero uh, through part zero zero one nine. Um, okay, so this is um, so basically uh, the songs come in um, different part numbered files because of this distributed file store. So look at my case class. Uh, I basically am copy pasting the header line in here. So if you don't know the structure, you have to you have to code it. Um, okay. So, and uh, you, you know these are the right types, doubles and strings and ints and longs, whatever you need. So now we've created our case class according to the header info. Then uh, what I'm now doing is I'm actually now reading the data, right? Not the header, but the songs data 001, part minus star. So the star operator will read all the different parts, no matter what the numbers are. So this allows me to create a data RDD, right? And because it's a text file method, all I've read is, uh, you know, end of line uh, broken up strings, right? Each row is, a, is, a, is a, just a line broken up by end of line. So then I can ask, uh, I'm assuming each row is a unique song for now. And so it looks like there are 31,369 songs. Okay, and then if I take just the top three elements of this data RDD, uh, I have some, uh, not a numbers and whatever early 16 and Rastaman, whatever. So there's this looks like songs, Santa Festival compilation. So now each line of the data consists of multiple fields separated by tabs. So this is now we're looking at the string in each row of the RDD, right? Um, so so we're going to basically do a, a, an operation where we split by tab here. That's what's going on here. Um, so now we are going to uh, write this function called parse line. Parse line takes an argument called line, which is of type string, and it returns uh, an, uh, uh, an object of case class type song that we defined. Okay. 
So you can see this guy is going to take a line and return a song. So, uh, and then to do that, what we have to do is we create something called to tokens. It's, in, it's another value. And this token takes the line that comes in and splits it by tab. And then now we're basically done. And once it splits it by tab, this token will be an array consisting of elements the, of the line, uh, right, containing each entry. And that's all we do. So we do songs, token of zero, tokens of one, token, and then we have to cast this into a double. Uh, so we have to do the right casting and all of this. But okay, so this is a low level thing. It's good to know. This will always work when you sort of start from RDDs. So then uh, I'm creating my parsed RDD, so which takes my data RDD and then uh, applies the map, where the map is taking the input as the function parse line. Remember, this is just like um, this is like this um, map syntax. So you could also do this. Control C. It could also be a much more uh, what do you call it? Line parse line of line. This should also work. Right, it's just uh, syntax. Okay, so um. So as you can see, this returns an RDD of type song. It's getting close to what we want. So then the last thing is we want to take this parsed RDD containing uh, elements of type song and turn it to a data frame. So that's just a 2DF operation. Okay, so we're done. And um, so that's a very nice use of case class. Once we get a data frame, we can register it as a temporary table. Uh, create or replace temp view. Yeah, that's the new syntax. So this will um, create a songs table for us. Okay. So now we can basically access that through multiple languages like we did on the first week and uh, do more. So here is my... Um, so if you run this on uh, Spark 1.6, then the next command will, uh, will, will throw a parsing error. Right. So, um, so this is... Um, just, uh, so the error means that we're trying to convert a missing value to a double, okay? So let's see. I mean, I'm kind of doing it like things happen to me. So, <laughs> so you know, a little less magic because this is normal, right? I mean, Mariama knows how much work it is to just scrape URLs, you know? Um, so, you know, then you basically, okay, you, 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 it's hard to read this output, you know, I still really find this annoying. So there's a number format exception issue, right? So, um, so the problem is we, we have to be careful about um, converting um, missing values to double. So let's update this parse function a little bit at a time, right? So, so what we're going to do is to deal with missing values, we're going to define another function in here. So this is like a function inside this function. So here inside parse line, now we have two double. Two double takes uh, uh, you know, an argument called value, which is of type string, and an argument called default value of type double. Okay, and then it returns a double. And then what I'm doing is uh, this try catch case exception handling thingy. So this is like, I think it's like, first semester computer science, right? But if you haven't done it, then no worries. It's like, it's trying something. If it fails, uh, what it's trying, then it catches what, you know, what fails in the try. And then these are exceptions that you can handle case by case. That's kind of the idea. So it's a nice way to, um, to field, bug, uh, field unexpected behavior. So what I'm first gonna do is I'm gonna take the value, which is the string that'll come in for me from my uh, line. And then I'm going to try to convert to a double, right? We know this works in a lot of cases, but some cases it failed. So then to, when in the, in the case where it doesn't automatically convert the string to a double, right? It should look like 0 0.001 or whatever. Um, then then uh, it will it'll do um, case uh, E, right? So this is this exception case. I'm calling it, you know, E. And, uh, and I'm going to give it the default value that I pass into the function. So I can say my default value is negative 849 or whatever, some number, right? I can usually say zero or 
So this is a nice way to control what you want the default to be and then later on um, know this. You can of course pass an array of default values and you know use this to have a nomenclature of exception types and all of this. But talk to a proper software engineer. <laughs> Don't listen to me about exception handling. Um, I handle the exception, you know, but <laughs> it's not the right way to handle it. But this is good. This is normal coding. So then you you define the two int function, and here it's the same exact thing. You know, we we turn to an int, and if it can't, then we just pass in the default value. So now what are we doing? We we are still in the block of the of our parse line function. So now we do the same thing like we did before. We have val tokens. We split the line by tabs, and then we simply do this. Right, because we've defined two double and two int uh, in, in here, we can pass those functions so they will always operate on the doubles and ints number conversion part. So let's see what happens with that. Okay, so that's defined, and now we're going to map our data RDD to a data frame and create a okay, so that looks good, and then let's try caching the table. So that's great as well. So now we can start exploring it, right? So we can select all the columns from the songs table and limit to the 10, top 10, oh, whatever, the first 10 entries. And now it's nice to visualize this uh, or just see it in a, um, I, think, I think this syntax worked for Zeppelin notebooks of the thing. If you just use person SQL and and you use uh, Tilos here. So Tilo is the one that wrote Pino. Tilos Pino. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think um, he's a bit busy trying to get a PhD, but uh, no, Tilo Wickland. Oh, yeah, here it is. So I mentioned this earlier very briefly. Sorry? What was that? Um, so I mentioned this before. So this is um, this way of going using pandoc to go between uh databricks into zeppelin and i guess he's also currently working on jupiter and i mean this is you know not commercially supported or anything but uh but there is a current version that works and dan's made some changes so the zeppelin notebooks will kind of work and if you guys really want uh let me know I, it'll just take a couple hours of my time and i can just push all the zeppelin versions of this stuff you know, it'll be, but the good thing is uh, why I went there is this particular expression, I believe, will work uh, automatically. Person SQL select star from songs table limit 10 will actually display in the Zeppelin display uh, thingy. But if you use Databricks' display function, then that won't work uh, everywhere. So it's always safe to use the dot show method instead of the display. Okay, but it is nice to see this, right? You, you see stuff, uh, you see loudness of the song, end of fade, the release, song ID, tempo, and so on, year. So now let's uh, explore this a bit more um, in the next notebook. Okay, so we've done our ETL. So of course, this is a trivial example, and the guys that did this already cleaned up a lot, okay? So, can you guess what fraction of time, at least until 2016, was spent on ETL in a data science process? You know? 80%. Yeah, that's a lower bound. So, I mean, this is a really crazy problem, and you can read this all, all over. Um, so, you know, you hire people with like, you know, PhDs and maths and like whatever, AI, blah, 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 and pay them a lot of money and, and they're doing like, I don't know, hardcore ETL. Yeah, Tilo? I think if you ask any time, how much time they spend on this or any empirical time, they spend on this. Yeah, that's true. They are extracting, right? When they do physics, <laughs> they're extracting. So if you include instrumentation and, and yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but this is post instrumentation, right? So we're already the data space is defined, there are images. Now we're just doing measurable maps from what's physically in disks, right? That part. If you ask anyone where you find mathematics or anything, just try to get all the different formats you get for different machines and different yeah. Of yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, yeah, I mean, they're data scientists. 
in my book. Yeah, of course they are. No, so this is, uh, and the crazy thing is we're not trained to do this, right? This is the problem because the typical stats scholars will focus on the methodologies and the models which is actually extremely important. But, um, and, and, and it's typical of a, of a standard machine learning course as well because there's no time. They want to get into methods. They want to explain what's going on, which is important. Anyway, I'll shut up. So here's, um, um, so we're just basically putting everything together here in one place. So we have our case class, we have our more fancy parse line. And so this is all we did. So just to, just to remind ourselves. Right? So it's exactly the same stuff in the last notebook. So what you can do is you can ask uh, Spark catalog list tables dot show to make sure that uh, what are all the tables that are currently in your in your shard, you know, in your um, uh, table uh, store. I guess this is Hive, right? Hive, Hive is under the hood here. So, yeah, so I mean, I have a bunch of stuff, New York baby names. Well, okay, this is actually a, a, an academic shard. This is part of this grant I have with Databricks. So it has all these academics from all over the world. So I don't know, it's a lot of people doing random things. So we should have our table here. Do we? Oh, do you guys have it? Oh yeah, songs table. And it says temporary, right? Temporary, uh, it's true, because we, we, we just want the table to be uh, temporary. And when we're done, you know. But if you want it to be permanent, then you can make it uh, permanent, as I showed you last week, I think, the syntax for that. And then uh, uh, when you come back, it'll be there. And then if you want to collaborate with lots of data scientists on the same code, then you want to do that. And uh, I mean, at Combiond, we, we use uh, you know, professional Databricks shard and, and in addition to all kinds of things, uh, Azure and this and that, and our own uh, nukes for more sensitive data. So what's nice about the notebook environments, and I think Zeppelin is good at this as well, it allows you to communicate uh, with uh, other data scientists uh, so they can just sit comfortably where they are and you can, you know, and, and Databricks allows you to chat as well, especially in the, you know, in the whatever, this, this professional version, you can have chats and it doesn't matter. I don't want to sell data. Oh, yeah, I'm not trying to sell Databricks, it's, but it's convenient. And also it has GitHub hooks which is really nice, which you can set up in Zeppelin as well, right? Um, and Jupyter you can as well. So, so that way, like all the code you're writing can automatically be pushed to your private GitHub repo. So, so. okay, so let's uh, do a first inspection. We are gonna select uh, all the columns and limit to 10. This is just from before. Um, now I'm gonna print the schema to, um, right? So I have, um, you know, artist ID, uh, is a string and it's nullable, so it's allowed to be null valued. And uh, and uh, some things are not allowed to be nullable and so on. So this is basically um, the, the schema of our table. And then uh, we can just do a SQL statement and um, count uh, how many rows there are. Okay, so this is the uh, other way of doing it in DataFrame API. I will generally stick to DataFrame or Dataset uh, API when I start getting into SQL. It's for future-proofing your brains, in my point of view, because <laughs> there are things you cannot do in SQL uh, that you can kind of only really do in, by dropping into the lower layers. So, and it's functional programming, so it's straightforward anyway. So. It's, and, and most of you know SQL, know SQL, so it doesn't. Um, so here I'm basically, uh, um, you know, using my nice SQL string, select duration and year from songs table, right? Um, so now um, I get this plot. And so if you, if you pay attention to what's going on, so I have year on the x-axis and the duration of the song in the uh, y-axis. And when I look at my plot options, so you, you know, so you can choose the plot type and stuff, but let's leave it as a line graph and look at the plot options. This is how you're gonna start playing around with uh, a little, uh, pretty decent level of visualization in the Databricks display. I mean, this is not as hardcore as, uh, as uh, you know, custom built D3 interactions you can do. 
um, which we'll try to show maybe um, if things go well in the afternoon. Um, but this is quite decent. So you, you just choose your keys to be the year and then your values to be the duration. So you can think of this as a key value pair um, display. And um, yeah, and of course there are uh, multiple songs per year. So I have to you know, define what, how I'm going to aggregate uh, the duration across years. So this is the aggregation operator. So you can say you want sum or uh, whatever, um, average or let's see. So if I do change to sum, it's, uh, you know, this is kind of a bad idea, right? So what's going on here? I mean, there's a lot of, maybe there are more songs than, uh, in that period. No idea. So let's use average. Um, Um, so you can play around, it's kind of how you'd explore it. Um, of course, it's not as rich as ggplot or matplotlib thingies or cview, whatever Python thing you're addicted to or R thing you're addicted to. Uh, that's okay because you know if you if you because if these will be small anyway. So what you can do is you can hit this function, this button called download CSV, and uh, you can just download it and. Uh, you know, whatever my song's table or something. As a, as a comma separated variable file. And uh, it'll just come down. Um, okay, so and I think there are options if you want to download the full thing versus just the first thousand, it'll ask you, because you have to rerun the command or something like this. So then you can take that CSV and ingest it into your local visualization, happy medium, and do whatever you want. Um, and okay, so uh, here are the um, exercises. Why do you think the average song duration increases dramatically in the seventies? So we I, we have a a seventies music lover or an audience, you know, case one. I, I know, I know why. You know why? Okay, we'll we'll ask you last. Any any guesses? Sorry. I can't hear it. Different. Oh, hardware. Oh, right. Like, okay. You think the okay so recording hardware? Okay, that's the new one. Okay, that's yeah. We should try to test this. That's a falsifiable hypothesis. Okay. Maybe. Uh, yeah. You have an idea. Yeah, that's kind of what I think. I mean, I, I have a theory, but it's it's correlated with, the, with disco. Uh, yeah, did you have a? So, I mean, I don't know whether that's the reason when you can actually see it here, but you have definitely the advent of progressive and art rock, which I mean, the average length of a song is generally fifteen minutes or something. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And this also changed the music genres. So I would say it's probably yeah, the uh, art, 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 album oriented book. So, I mean, while we're you know, talking further, it would be really cool if you can find any examples of albums with these authors, right? And as you all like, it'll be interesting to find the longest song that year, for example. Yeah. So, so, that's see, one. See if you can get Chris Pitt, 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 Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, I mean, I have my own theory, right? This was completely, it's, uh, I don't think it's falsifiable. <laughs> but, you know, I thought, like, because I listen to a lot of these songs, like Beatles and whatever, and, and I don't know, people are smoking a lot of pot, and they're, like, happy <laughs> flower children. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they just like, had no time, and I don't know. Because you have a spike at 68. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's... <laughs> Hey, we are doing voodoo now, right? This is not science, but it's sort of, it's fun. So, um, yeah, so what, what you can do is add error bars with standard deviations around each average, which is a really good idea. Uh, that's statistically important because what we're doing when we put the average is that, um, so there's a lot going on even that probabilistic model here is. So we're saying every year there are a bunch of songs that actually are sung and only a small set of them were sampled by this, whatever, the data set we have. We don't know exactly how it was sampled. 
right? And also remember, we're not looking at the full 1 million songs. We're looking at some subset because we want to write it on the community edition. So then, um, you know, the exact average of every single song uh, in some language is the true population mean, right? These are just basic concepts from Stat 101. And what we're doing is we're uh, using the sample average to estimate it, right? But, uh, you know, the classical theory says the sample average converges to the true average, I mean, the true population mean, uh, if sample size is large enough. And here, the sample size, uh, so what, what you, the sample mean is what's called a statistical estimator, right? So we'll study all of this in gl glorious detail, all the way from sets and types in the, in the foundations course. So statistical estimator estimates this unknown quantity, which is the population mean. And it's a random object because every time a new sample of songs gets fed in, it'll find the, the, the duration and then it'll put an average. So it's called a point estimator because it, you know, it's like a, it just gets a point on the, on the, on the uh, real line, right? The real line is the duration of the song. So every time a new sample comes in, it'll put a different estimate, point estimate. So of course the question is this uh, estimator, uh, you know, is, uh, has some noise in it. So if I do this a million times, what fraction of these point estimates will be in the inner 99% confidence interval, right? That's called a confidence set. It's, it's in one day, it's called confidence interval. So a confidence set is actually, a, a, you know, a, a random set that ensures that the, the point estimator, uh, you know, gives, uh, you know, the right answer inside the set, uh, 99 or whatever percent of the time, right? That's uh, very important, which means in 1D it translates to standard errors, these little bars you want to really have. So these are exercises you can do, and you know, if you don't want to get into Twitter because scared or whatever, bored, then you can just do that exercise for, uh, for the stuff too. Um, yeah, I should add that to the assignment. Um, so, so, you know, you can do this as well. So. Um, do one of the exercises um, in 013, like uh, standard error. Right? Um, you know, so this is a non Twitter person MD. Um, Sound good? Um, yeah, of course, you, you won't have this little cell in your notebook, right? Um, okay, so where are we? 14? Yeah. So yeah, it was 014. Okay, so... So you can also do these other things, right? You can you can ask how did the tempo change over time? How did the average loudness change over time? Uh, so let's try that. Um, select loudness. You have to go into options. Yeah. Um, so you just have to you know, let's look at average and uh, oof, that's interesting. Oh, it's increasing. People are going deaf, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, this is fun, right? Just uh, just play around. Um, um, so another technique for visualizing or exploring large data sets uh, is sampling. So this is uh, extremely important because um, uh, we can generate, because these data sets can be truly large, it can be like 100 million, right? So, so let's see. Um, so in our current uh, thing here, we're already reaching 8.47, 8.45 million. So if I want to like actually do some exploration visually of, 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 uh, of status updates in this collector, what I have to do is be very careful about my my uh, my you know sampling design into my visual exploration. So I have to sap sample carefully. It's very large data, and then get visual insights. Right? I mean through SQL. So to do that, it's actually 
exactly the same except you have to do this extra function called uh, uh, take sample or something like this. We will do that later, so I don't. I just want to put a pointer to remind you. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Sorry. So yeah, here it is. So you just do a sample with replacement equals true or false, right? And then you can specify the fraction you want. So you can. Have, this is like a completely random subsampling of uh, zero point one is ten percent. Ten percent of the whole thing. So, uh, I mean, like the US experiments we did, we could barely only see 0.03% or something uh, because we couldn't afford a bigger cluster in Amazon. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's very important. And then everything just works through your standard pipeline. So let's try this in ggplot. Um, so this should just work because our Databricks Community Edition already has a lot of these standard Python and R visualization, not everything, a lot of them already there. Um, and because ggplot comes with these standard errors, you don't have to do the work. Uh, the curse of packages, right? You can just do a lot of things without necessarily understanding um, the details. Um, anyway. That's, uh, that's a nice view because you can start seeing there's quite a lot of spread here. Okay, so um, you can add jitter to year value in the plot above, you know, ggplot uh, jitters and plot sample points for other parameters in the data and so on. So we've kind of explored it at least one dimension at a time. Now we are going to get into uh, um, Clustering. Yeah, I think we'd be on time for a few cut. So it's fika, am I right? Or am I saying fika, fika is fika. Good. Yeah, fika. Yeah. Because I I thought I, I was told that fika means fucker in German or something. Yeah. Is that true? Oh yeah, he's a German. So I'm a, yeah, I got into trouble in Stockholm. I'm like okay. Yeah, Sweden is kind of like Welsh, like, because, like, it's sing songy. Um, anyway, um, so this is step three, right? So we're going to model now. Um, so this is the, uh, the sort of main step that your managers would be interested in because they want to extract value from something they can predict after this stage. So, um, so what's the what's the main idea? We're going to use the simplest. Uh, unsupervised method called uh, k-means clustering, right? This is a maybe the first algorithm you'll learn in a machine learning course or a data mining course. Like Matteo Magnani was here yesterday. Uh, he teaches a course in data mining. Um, so this is a nice... Um, and the actual probability theory under the hood is very simple. It's actually uh, a mixture of spherical Gaussians, okay? Um, Gaussian, uh, sorry, what do you call it? Normal distributions also called Gaussian distributions in D dimensions. If your feature vectors live in D dimensions, say D is three. So then you have centroids, which is the mean vector of uh, each three dimensional Gaussian, but then it's spherically symmetric because the variance covariance matrix is the uh, identity matrix. So if you don't know what these words are, it just means that you're modeling the clusters so that there is a center and everyone in that cluster is distributed uniformly in a decaying sense away from the center. And there is no accounting for like an ellipsoidal scattering or things like that, but that you need uh, um, variance, covariance structures. So that's basically the probability model of the k-means algorithm. Um, so here we basically are going to do the following. We, we will um, essentially repeat everything again. So, um, so we know exactly uh, what we need from the last stuff. So simply, now we're going to use uh, uh, the machine learning library, right? So let me first of all dive into this. So let's see, you go to Apache Spark. Um, uh, not GitHub. So yeah. So if you go to uh, https spark.apache.org and um, 
I mean, how am I learning all these things? I just go and do the work, right? So I just go and look at the, the libraries and the programming guides and so on. So that's what you want to do. Um, so here are the, here should be the machine learning um, um, documentation and programming guide and um, sort of a quick intro. Uh, refer to the ML guide for usage examples. So this is kind of where I'm like learning things. And, and this is huge. Remember, I, I sort of databricsify the almost the entire programming guide for Spark SQL. I cannot do that for this. I mean, it's not worth it, right? But I've done, uh, you know, so this is where you want to dive into. And I, and I want to point out because a lot of you have taken machine learning courses. And after today's lectures on ML pipelines, which we'll get to quickly, you should be able to go and read this and figure out how to do the syntax and in a fully scalable way. You should know all the concepts from a standard course. So uh, it's, uh, and, and you know, and get into this. This is quite a lot of stuff. So you can figure in the clustering, which is what we're going to dive into. You will see that um, there's a lot going on, right? There is, um, you know, k-means. We will try to do LDA, although I may have to go fast, super fast on LDA. There's bisecting k-means, Gaussian mixture models, and um, and of course, there's a whole host of Spark packages which you can attach that has a lot more clustering methods. Uh, classification regression has a lot of built-in methods, multi-layer perceptrons, uh, linear support vector machines, gradient boosted tree classifier. We may get to that today, I don't know. Um, okay, so so don't just, my, my sort of, I don't know, consulted many companies the last several years and, you know, you should do stuff that's like publicly available, like proofed and tested by lots of people around the world, then go and or roll your own model uh, is my advice. Because often this will give you the, what do you call it, um, the benchmark, right? If you, if you want to do your own thing because you're so amazing, well, you have to show that you can improve on what people are doing, you know, you know. Because this is not just one person, right? This is a lot of people constantly improving the code. Um, okay, so let's quickly get back here. Um, so I'm basically calling the uh, vector assembler, uh, uh, importing this vector assembler from the uh, Spark ML uh, library, feature library. So the vector assembler is uh, like, um, the following thing. So I'm defining uh, something called training data, which is an immutable. And this new is my constructor. So it takes my uh, default constructor vector assembler, and then it, it puts in, uh, it sets the input columns to be the array that has uh, duration, tempo, and loudness. Because remember, those columns exist in our, in our um, data frame. And then it uh, sets the output columns with the label called features, and then it's going to apply that to it's going to you know uh, to this um, it's going to use the transform method and apply that to uh, this table songs table. Right? So this basically uh, is passing in the data frame into uh, this. So all it's doing is just picking these three columns and uh, putting them in an in an output column. It's because the, the machine learning pipeline expects a column by default called features, which it start us starts from, okay? So, and because this is all, uh, I don't know what architecture it is, but the idea for big data is like, uh, you don't just rewrite the column, you know? Because, you know, there are all those feature columns that came in. You don't just delete the ones you don't want. You actually just create extra columns that you um, that you want um, that you want to play with. So that's what the new features column will be will be created. This way, you see, you can go back and and do uh, feature reengineering. You can go back and pull other columns and define, you know. Um, and also, it's very expensive to delete things in a big distributed file store. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, then, um, so. I think that's what I basically blabbered. So now let's take three, and uh, so um, we are we are able to see that you see we've taken the three things that we want: duration, 
tempo and loudness and put them into its own array, right? This guy is ready to go into the into the machine learning uh, uh, library. I mean, and the nice thing is you can plug in various other machine learning algorithms from this vector assembler. Now, a transformer, what's a transformer? A transformer is an abstraction that includes feature transformers and learned models, right? So technically, a transformer implements a method transform, which converts one data frame into another data frame. Right? And, and it usually does this by appending one or more columns. So uh, the, the feature transformer might take a data frame, read a column, map it to a new column, and output a new data frame with the mapped column appended. But uh, a learning model is also a transformer. A learning model might take a data frame, read the column containing the feature vectors, predict the label for each feature vector, and output a new data frame with predicted labels appended as a column. So this is a subtle thing. Because when you train a machine learning model, what you're building is a, a statistical estimator. But the estimator, when it is seen as a transformer, can be used for predictions. Okay, that's the Spark framework. And the beauty is uh, uh, the notation is incredibly tight between mathematical statistics and uh, uh, no SQL or whatever. And this again, I'm saying is beautiful because um, in Berkeley, people really talk to each other across departments. So here is estimator. Uh, so it abstract the concept of a learning algorithm and it fits or trains on the data. Uh, this estimator implements the method fit, which accepts a data frame and produces a model. And the produced model is a transformer. Sorry, that was, yeah. Estimator does the fit, and then it produces a model, uh, which, can, which becomes a transformer. So yeah, this is, um, let's just, just do this instead of talking. So display uh, training data dot select. Um, and I'm now seeing this. You see, because I, I've done my, uh, I've, I've put these features there, so now I only, I'm only selecting these four columns, and um, I can see my feature vectors. This is a separate column. And um, this is kind of a crash course on k-means, right? So does anyone not know the k-means algorithm? Okay, does anyone know the uh, sensitivity to initial conditions of the k-means optimization routines, which can lead to completely wrong answers, even for trivial examples. Do you know what I mean? Like, you can do k-means, you will know what k-means is supposed to do, but are you aware that k-means can actually do exactly the wrong thing, completely the wrong thing, even for very small data sets? It depends on the initial condition. So I think I want, yeah, let me kind of go through this, because we have time. Um, so at a high level, this is the idea. So it's just, uh, you know, just all from Wikipedia, right? So just embedding images. So, um, so, you, so, the, uh, so you first have K initial means or centers. So in this case, K is three, and then the centers are red, green, and uh, black. And um, so these are my, my data points, right? Uh, these gray ones. So then these three points are randomly generated somehow. Okay, and that's kind of very important. Um, so then the K clusters are created by associating every observation with the nearest mean, right? So this is green because it's closest to the green circle instead of the red and so on. So you get these so-called Voronoi diagrams that partition each data to the nearest uh, center. So then you can see them as cluster, red cluster, green cluster, and blue cluster. So that's the first step. And then uh, the centroid of each of the K clusters becomes the new mean. So now you go and say, okay, here are my data points. Let me compute its centroid, which is nothing but a pair, uh, but an average in each coordinate, right? You take all the points in 2D, just find the column average for each column. That gives you the, 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 the mean in 2D, which is the centroid. So now um, the centroid you see move this way because you can see there's a lot of more points this way. So this dotted green, the original one here, is moving this way. Same with this blue and this red is, is moving there. And of course, this red moves there because it's the only one data point. So the mean of a one point in 2D is itself. So it's happening there. So then uh, you basically do steps two and three um, and keep repeating them until 
this m distance it moves is negligible. How are you define negligible to be the some delta or whatever? Some. So it's uh, and then it stops. Then you say the algorithm is converged, and then you report those uh, converged centroids as the cluster centers, and then all the points that are closest to those <laughs> cluster centers as belonging to the cluster. That's basically the algorithm. Um, so the assignment step two is also referred to as the expectation step, and the update step three is uh, the maximization step, and it's one of these uh, maybe second or third most used uh, statistical um, uh, or randomized algorithms of last century, right? You know the most widely used one? It's by these chemical physics guys, right? It's the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. So anyway, we will we'll, we'll, we'll visit that in the foundations course. So anyway, this is basically showing the standard algorithm in action. And what's very important is this caveat. So as the k-means, it's a heuristic algorithm, right? It has, it's sensitive to the initial conditions for sure. Uh, there is no guarantee that it'll, it, it'll converge to the global optimum. What is a global optimum? The global optimum is the probability model that says that there are k clusters, and each cluster is coming from a Gaussian distribution with the center that has spherical symmetry. Even if this model were true, I'm saying that, um, yeah, we can just bring it in, you know. So even if the model were true, what, um, what this caveat is saying is, so that means you do pure simulations, the, the k-means algorithm will not necessarily converge to the true answer. So it's important, right? Because it's obviously dependent on the initial conditions. Um, so this is a general problem with uh, local optimization. And so, I mean, Uppsala is kind of a pretty special place for me, right? So, because I, I do a lot of global optimization in set-value mathematics where you simply cannot afford to make mistakes, right? These are sensitive problems like air traffic and things like that. So, uh, Uppsala is a pretty powerful, uh, well-known group in a tiny world. It's called Computed Proofs and Analysis. Uh, and there are other groups around this as well. So you can use uh, the, the, the machine number screen quite rigorously and solve a global optimizations problem in a guaranteed way. Uh, but you have to start extending um, you know, arithmetic to positive and negative infinities and positive and negative zeros and, and formalize division by zero. It's all doable for the extended interval Newton operator. So um, anyway, I think there are courses here if you want to get into it. But that's an overkill for k-means, right? And also, those algorithms kind of suck because they don't really scale yet, right? They, there are no, no fault-tolerant versions of them that work uh, right now. Okay, so I'll let you read all this, and, and I'm just showing you for the flower data what's going on. So here is uh, um, the, the, k, the, the iris flower data. I think this is uh, uh, dimensions one, two, and three. I forget what they are. Oh, yeah, the three species. So this is the actual data, iris setosa, iris versicolor, and iris virginica. And I think these are the sepal lengths or something, you know, the flower. Uh, and um, so this is um, the k-means, uh, you know, cluster returns this as the truth. Just to know, you know, this may not be reality, right? So um, anyway, this is, um, here is our, um, um, training data. So now we're basically saying, let me create a model called new k-means. I'm going to set the number of clusters k to be 2, and I'm going to fit with the training data, right? So uh, it should take about 40 seconds, I think. Um, and then um, so you, know, you can just look at all the methods that are available for a model, right? So you can do and do a dot tab thing. So you can see it's as instance of, you can clear it to uh, cluster centers, you can have What's the compute cost? Explain parameters and get seed. And so, you know, if you dive into the programming guide and then the, the, the docs, um, Scala Spark docs for this, you can really understand. So, here I'm just showing you the cluster centers. So, it shows me here are the cluster centers. And, um, you know, so this is um, the, our loudness uh, and tempo and duration, right? Um, so we have only two clusters, so we have two points in three dimensions, right? So it's just showing uh, coordinate-wise. So then, um, um, I mean, showing them uh, row by row each point. Then we have the model transformed, where we basically take the model and then we transform it. 
I guess people are motionless, right? Is this only two more minutes? Um, so then um, the model transform takes a model and we simply apply this transform method to the training data. So now we can get predictions as the last column. So we're just, you know, just throwing the, the same uh, data back at it. So and then if you look at it, uh, here is our, our schema. So we have artist ID, lat long, all the stuff we originally had. And then uh, we have this features vector, right? And then if I look at the schema for model transform, I have this extra column um, <coughs> prediction, right? So that's basically it's your fit, and then you, you can just throw the stuff at it. So here we just have, um, right? So the column features was specified, remember, by the vector assembler. And then the new column prediction uh, is from the model transformed. So now if I just look at uh, select duration, tempo, loudness, and the prediction um, as my transform, and then I display it. Um, so I'm just sampling a fraction. Um, um, so then I can see what my, uh, you know, which cluster that the songs fall into, right? The zeros and ones, I only have two clusters. So, um, and remember this is unsupervised, so I'm not worried about uh, label prediction. So prediction here just means, yeah, just uh, So then I can just visualize this. And uh, after Fika, we'll, we'll get into, um, you know, a bit more we have to do with uh, transforming <laughs> scales and things like that. So, um, 